Ah, it says record on there, the REC at the top. I want you to think about is how bilingual that fits into human rights education. Keep that in your mind when you're doing the meetings. I mean, we're gonna have a discussion about it in class. How bilingual education fits into a human rights education. Okay. Everybody okay now? We can start. So we have a guest speaker. Had to do information. <laughs> we have a guest speaker, his name is Carlos Mauricio, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Carlos, right? God, we're very, actually very privileged and honored that he came to visit us because um, his message is a very important message for us as human beings and as teachers both. Um, he was a professor of, at a university in San Salvador in 1983. He was abducted and tortured by the Salvadorian military because he spoke out against injustice. So he's a, a torture survivor. Um, at the present time, he um, works in Jesus. He lives in San Francisco. He's a high school science teacher, substitute teacher, which allows him to do what he's doing now. He travels across the country, across the world, speaking out against injustice, speaking out for human rights. Um, so, like I said, we're very honored that he's with us today. He's going to tell you more about himself because all I have is his word. It doesn't tell me very much. So, let's uh, welcome him. Thank you. 
run away, but I couldn't because as I did try to run to other place, another group of men came. So I was completely surrounded by a group of probably 16 men. And, uh, you know, and I couldn't run because the, the, the sandal that I, I had, it was uh, loose. You know, when the, the guy grabbed me from my foot, the sandal was loose, so I couldn't run. So I decided to, to try to go back to the building, which I felt was safe. It was my heart. But I couldn't, because then the guys surround me. And what I, what I tried is that it was a, a false bag in there, those old models, the Beatles. The old models, they have a bumper, longer than a bumper. But in the 70s, the 80s, the, 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 the false bag and have a bumper. So uh, in out of desperation, I grabbed the bumper, you know, and I began to shout for help. But I was surrounded by those guys, you know, by a death squad, and as I was trying to, to, to I was grabbing the, the bumper there. Basically, I was welded to the bumper, you know? And uh, I was crying for help. I was shouting, help me, help me. And the guys became very, very angry. They were furious because I tried to escape, see? And uh, they began to beat me, my hands, they beat my hands. But I was so stuck in the bumper that they couldn't, they couldn't make me lose the bumper. So one of the guys came and he began to beat me with the, the butt of the rifle in my stomach, in my head. So after he beat me, I lose the bumper, I fell to the ground, and they just came and kicked me out. And all of them kicked me. So I remember that uh, when, they, when they pushed me, when they lift me, I was bleeding already. I had a big gash. Yeah. And I was pushed, so pushed and forced into a, a waiting van. It was a gray van with a with the, uh, side door open. They were waiting. Then they pushed me inside, and I was blindfolded, and I was handcuffed. They put me in the ground, the floor of the, of the car, and I was there. I knew I was going to be killed. I knew my death. I knew that my, my death was a matter of time. I knew that because I have seen, as I said before, I have seen people being kidnapped by the army, and later they they turn it out uh, killed on the street. So for me, it was a matter of thinking. Well, you know, this may this is possible when you are a person who um, denounce the injustices, denounce the atrocities carried out by whatever government doing. My first thought it was about my kids. But I was came in. Um, despite that I was blindfolded on the, 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 the floor of the car, I was able to, to see a little bit through the blindfold at the cheekbone. As I lay down there, I was able to see the, the tops of the building. And as I was there, you know, they began to drive. They drove away, and I just thought, well, as soon as I'm able to see the tops of the trees, the canopies of the trees, they are going to kill me there, because they used to kill in the countryside. So they bring the prisoner, whoever is captured, and kill it in the countryside. So I was, you know, thinking about my fate. However, as they drove around with me in the van, uh, it came to my mind that probably they want to keep me alive for some reason. Because after three hours or four hours driving around, they didn't kill me. They stopped sometimes, and I thought that maybe this is the end of it. Maybe they will take me out of the van and they will kill me. But they didn't do it. And then I began to realize that they want me alive. That they will not kill me immediately, but after being tortured. So in that moment, I really wanted to, to be killed. You know, I didn't want to be tortured because I, I will be tortured and then I'll be killed. So I will 
do better, they give me immediately. So I accept it. I accept it. I say, well, they give me with a clean shot in the back of my head. That's okay with me. I don't want to be hurt. Because I have seen the, the corpses, the mutilated corpses of people after being tortured. So my other worry it was that since I realized that they want to keep me alive, my other worry was about the people that I knew, people that were my friends or relatives. And uh, I was sure that if they asked me uh, about a person that I knew, or a colleague or a student, and I do give names, I was sure that that person was going to be captured and accused of being a, a terrorist or a guerrilla or whatever. This is, this is my trip in the, in the van. I have not arrived yet to any place, but I was in the van. And I was thinking about my future. What is going to happen to me? So finally, after four or five hours driving around San Salvador, you know, we arrived to a place that I was blindfolded, so I didn't know what exactly it was. Uh, I knew that we stay in the city because I was able to see the, the lights in the, in the poles, you know, the public lamps. I was able to, to look some of the lights because it was dark already. So probably around 9 or 10 p.m. we came to a place and, and uh, I, I was in a way I was relieved because in, in the area that I lay the pipe, the exhausting pipe of the car, you know, the heat came to the to the uh, area in which I, I lay, and I was burning, it was so hot, and I was getting burned in my, in my, my side. So when, when they arrived there and they stopped the, the car, it was a kind of relief for me, because I was, was getting burned in the side of my body. So I remember that they left the van, they came for me, they took me out, and I was taking everything from me, my, my, my watch, my wallet, my, my ring, everything. And after they took everything from me, I was pushed inside of the plane. Because I was blind. Why didn't feel it? I was blind. So I was pushed. Uh, what I do remember is that I climbed some steps, probably a dozen steps. And then I do remember that Somebody opened a door, probably one of the guys one of the guys with me. Somebody opened the door, they pushed me inside, and somebody closed the door. It was another world. This is completely different. You know, I remember that it was a narrow hall. Because I was blindfolded, but I was touching the, 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 the walls because I wanted to avoid being hit by something that I didn't I was blindfolded anyway, but I used my hands to walk as a blind person. The very first thing that happened there is that the smell of the place, was the smell of the place, horrible, horrible place, a horrible smell. It was sticky, it was sour, it was something horrible that I remember that I put my face away from it because it was the, 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 the smell of death, you know? I got it there. When I was there, I, I realized because I, I did, when I walk, I did a step on bodies. You see, I did a step on something soft. When I, I step on something soft and then I try to realize what it was, I looked through it, it was a hand. But I didn't move. So when I did the next step, I stumbled in a, in a leg. The leg moved. So I realized that I was in a chamber of torture. I'm in a chamber of torture. But I wanted to be killed, you know. They, they got me here. They, they are going to torture me, and they, they are going to kill me. So I would prefer they kill me. And also, the other situation for me is that I was so worried about my friends, about my family, that if they ask me about them, if I do tell names, then uh, they are going to be captured. So, but if I am dead, I cannot talk. So I decided that I would tell them. Well, I am dead. Whatever they do to me, that's okay. I am dead. And dead people do not talk. 
So that's one of the ways that I confronted the, 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 the portrait of the torture. But um, as I was there, you know, the first torture comes from the, from the fact that I was forced to listen to other people being tortured. And I was there in the chamber of torture, and I heard people being given electroshocks. I heard women being raped. I heard people being asphyxiated, and I knew that I was not. So, um, one of the guys came, I was, I was sitting there, you know, and uh, I remember that I tried to explore the area through the space, the little space that I have, I was able to move through. And I saw other people handcuffed and also sitting in the, in the backs against the wall as I was sitting there. And uh, I recognized a colleague in the same, in the same department that I taught at the university, another teacher, another professor, he was there. And uh, the guy came, the interrogator came, and took me to a place in this, which I was too much. They, they, they took a picture of me, took the blindfold away, ordered me to close the eye. They opened it. They, when I opened the eye, he was behind the camera. Then, uh, after the picture, he took me to another place. I was blind from there. So he took me to another place, a room, a very clear room, a big room, empty room. And I remember that he was behind me, took the blindfold away from me, and he left me there in the center of the room. When, as I was, when I was able to see, then I saw mirrors. The walls were mirrors, right? So I realized that somebody was behind the mirrors identifying me. See, so I sat there, no, I stayed there. I stayed there, you know, for a while. And then maybe probably after 15 or 20 minutes, the guy came from behind, put me the blindfold away, and they, he took me to another place. I was kept standing up, you know, I was handcuffed to something, probably a pipe. I don't know, probably a pipe, because I never saw it. But I was handcuffed from one hand. That way forced me to stand up always, meaning that I couldn't sleep. So I was deprived of sleep. Best. If, if I tried to lean against the wall when I was tired, somebody came and beat me up. Uh, in a given moment, you know, when I felt that nobody was around, I tried to look to people through the, through the space and then a, a girl came, and as I was looking, the guy made the, the intention that hit me. And then I covered with my hand, I covered, I said, ah, you are looking, ah, yeah. So they hit me after that. He hit me, and they put the blindfold very tight. So the next time that the guy came and tried to hit me, I said <laughs> nothing, you know? I was looking, but I said nothing. <laughs> so I, I learned that. But uh, later, they took me to another place, the place that I heard the people being touched. And it was really horrible. That is why uh, myself, the torture survivor, is coming to tell this story, a story of a, a, a survivor, because they took me there. They began to question me, and uh, when they asked me about the person that I knew, I said, yes, I know him. For example, they asked me about the, the chancellor of the university. Do you know the chancellor? Of course I know him. He's a very good person. He's like he's my boss. But he's a guerrilla member. I don't know, I don't know he's a guerrilla member. No? Besides, I just came back from Mexico. So I have no participation whatsoever in the guerrilla movement. I never, never use a gun against the government. Never. I don't know how to use a gun. But uh, they began to torture me to make me accept that I was a guerrilla member, that I participated in the army movement. I never participated in that. But they insisted, insisted in that, that I was a guerrilla member, that I, I, was, I was in the army opposition. And I said, no, I never did, never, ever. However, the worst of the worst came when they changed the accusation. They say, 
you know, you do not confess because you have been trained not to confess. That's why you do not confess. So, and you have been trained in cure. In cure? I've never been in cure. You are a guerrilla commander. Guerrilla commander? Wow. Wow, guerrilla commander. Yeah, you are a guerrilla commander. And then the wars of the world began. I was hungry. For three days, they tortured me very, very badly. Then I realized something the well, you know, they want me to confess I've been in Cuba. I've never been in Cuba. What can I do? I confess it. Okay. I've been in Cuba. You want me to confess me in Cuba? Okay, I've been in Cuba. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, you're an idiot. Why well, you didn't tell us from the very beginning? Look at yourself. I was completely destroyed. <laughs> yes, I, 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 went, I went to Cuba. And then the guy said, okay, you have been in Cuba. Yes, I, said, I went to Cuba. Okay, now you have to tell me who gave you the money, who gave you the passport, <laughs> who traveled with you. You have to tell me in which military training camp in Cuba you have been. And I say, sorry, but I've never been in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it, that's it, the whole situation here, that torture is, is, not, is, is useless for gathering information. Because we do confess wherever they want to confess. It is clear. You want to avoid being tortured. Wherever. Tell me, and I say it. So they didn't believe me, of course. They began, they continued torturing me. But I'm a very lucky guy. I'm a very lucky person. I am one of the few torture survivors from that period in El Salvador. And uh, when, uh, in a given moment, I was very, very worried that they asked me uh, about a woman that she was indeed a guerrilla. She was a guerrilla commander. And the, the government has, uh, she was wanted by the army. And the army offered a bounty for her. Any person denouncing her, uh, the army would pay $50,000 for her. And she was my girlfriend. Oh. Oh, I was very worried that they say, oh yeah, you know, we know that she's, so I say, if they ask me about her, forget it. I am frank. <laughs> but, uh, but they never asked me about her. So I never told them. But, uh, you know, after being in the chamber of torture for about nine days, I've been blind for them. Something, something uh, very uh, oddly happened. You know, I do feel pity for Jose Padilla, who had been blind for the for years, <laughs> I was blind for the only nine days, nine nights. And what happened is that as as the time goes by when you are blindfolded, then as the time goes by, you begin to lose the sense of time and space. You no you no longer know what time is it or where you are because now you have no connection with the environment. So that is one of the roles of the blindfold. When I have seen people in Iraq or any other places, civilians like me, being blindfolded, they immediately bring memories memory of myself. You know? Because the blindfold is not only to block you from seeing, the blindfold has another role. The blindfold, as the time goes by, you know, you begin to lose your own humanity. That's the invention. Because then you become nobody. You become zero. You are so vulnerable to questioning. And, and in the top of that, you are being tortured. You are blindfolded. And in the top of that, you are tortured every day. And then the most horrible feeling comes when because you lose the, 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 the tie with the environment, then it becomes a feeling of hopelessness. You no longer have hope. You really want to die. You really want to die because you are nothing. And that is what they are making of you. So, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, prisoners were there when I was there. I, I saw a couple of them. But uh, many of the prisoners uh, were there and sometimes they were taken and never came back to the chamber of torture. <coughs> uh, after
after being badly, badly tortured, you know, uh, the one guy came and took me out of the chamber of torture. As I was taken out, the, the guy who took me out took away the blindfold from me. And then I realized that I was in the National Police Headquarters in El Salvador. And the guys who came to kidnap me and the guys who tortured me were indeed members of the National Police. So for me, it was a big problem because I was the witness. And the government denied any links between those guys and the government. We do not know who they are, the government, like always. But I was the first one who was captured by those guys and then uh, turned out in the National Police Headquarters. And one of the torturers told me that. He said, you cannot leave. Impossible. We cannot release you. you. You can tell everybody that we are the people. And I told him, I am going to, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. No, guys, keep my mouth shut. But they say, no, impossible. So when they took me out of the chamber of torture, and they put me in a common cell, so I thought that I was going to be killed. They put me there. I was able to see, so I saw the prison. And we were talking with other prisoners. But two days after, a guard came and said, you come out. So I came out, and I was taken to a real, real horrible, horrible place. This is the clandestine cells in the National Police Choir. This is underground cells. That is really bad. And I knew that I was underground, because they took me. I, I, I had no blindfold. So I, I remember that they came down one floor, the second floor, then they, I, I, I woke. They opened a place, it was closed, they opened a place, and they pushed me inside. They had some steps, and I walked there. They had tiny cells, a horrible place, dark place, dump, and I remember that it has a kind of running water on the, on the floor. And uh, when I touched the, the, the walls also were very, very uh, humid. But I knew that I, I was underground because when I look at the ceiling of the cell, what I saw, thousands and thousands of cockroaches. Thousands of them. Like a bunch, big bunch of them are moving. They were moving <laughs> close to my head, <laughs> close to my head. A big bunch of them. They were the Probably they are going to give me a life. What can I What can I do? So I stayed there. I stayed there for probably five hours. After five hours, the same guy came. He took me from there and put me back in the cell with the other prisoner. I was there wondering, question, why they took me down there and then I am back? Why they didn't kill me? Or why didn't they leave me there? The answer came the next day. So the next day, the International Committee of the Red Cross came. And they found me. That's where I am alive. They say, where have you been? <laughs> well, I've been here. They took me down. They took me down. I was in the clandestine cell. Say, Is that right? Yeah, I was in the clandestine cell. That's why you didn't find me here. They say, your family came to denounce your kidnapping to the, to, the, to the quarter. And now we are looking for you. Say, well, you know, in a way, I believe that I will not be killed because you guys found me. But there is a, a chamber of torture around the corner. And there are a lot of people being tortured there. You should go there. That is the place that should, you should go. And the guy say, the government do not allow us to get in there. Say, well, but that is, I am telling you, I say, they have the chamber of torture around the corner. I was there. And also they have planted themselves downstairs. Um, and the first question that the guy made, because I have to fill it out a form, the first question that the Red Cross International representative did, he said, why do you have been detained? But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They just took me, they brought me here. I've been tortured. I've been saying that I have to confess that I am a guerrilla member, and then I have to confess that I want to cure. But uh, the reality, I don't know why I was facing. I know, I know that the real reason is that the Salvadoran government believed 
that the university and the, the community in the university was the, the university was an enemy. Students, professors, and workers. And that's why they came to the university and closed it. And that's why it was targeted. Because they, the army has the idea that universities and educated people are enemies. That's why it's so dangerous that you are able to think. A thinker, government people do not like people who make questions. You see, that's a big problem for them. You have to accept that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You have to accept that. No? That they have um, making the atomic bomb. They have to accept no questions. Otherwise, you are in trouble. So, in our case, the Salvadorian government target educators, and also they they target uh, labor unions, uh, leaders of the, the labor unions. They target uh, students, union students, and basically they target a lot the church workers. And if you remember, in El Salvador, in 1980, Archbishop Romero was killed. That is the 24th of March of 1980, and also in December 1980, uh, four North American nuns were killed in El Salvador. Many North sisters were killed in El Salvador. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people from the church, priests. And finally, in 1989, 16th of November 1989, six Jesus priests were killed. If you remember November 16, 1989, the army came to the university, Catholic university. They took over, they came, and they killed eight persons. They killed six priests there, also killed the woman who held them, and her daughter, a 14 years old girl. Eight persons were killed. They were taken out of the um, dormitories, uh, laid down in the, in the, in the uh, backyard of the university, and shot to them 16 rifles in the back of the head, all of them. The guy who came to kill them, it was a, a platoon made of 26 Salvadorian officers in the army. 19 of them were trained in the School of the Americas. The School of the Americas is here in the United States, in Fort Bend, in Georgia. That is the School of the Americas. 19 of those guys who came and killed the priest, 19 of them were trained there. So, when I met Roy Bourgeois, Roy Bourgeois is the founder of the School of the Americas, watch. I realized that indeed, in the United States, there is a grassroots movement trying to close the School of the America, you know? And I realized that that's part of my task, to help Roy Bourgeois and the School of America to watch, to close the school. Still there, they're still training soldiers. They come to become tortured there. They are training tortured, and they go back to Latin America, and they became real, real abusers. 70,000. 70,000 Latin American soldiers have been trained there. 70,000 of them. And if you see the pictures that in the School of America they have about the model, the examples of the graduate, you can see the pictures, all of them dictators. All of them dictators. Uh, Noriega, uh, uh, Banzer, Videla, Rio Monte. And the guy who ordered the killing of Bishop Romero in Salvador also is a graduate from the School of America. The guy who ordered my torture, the guy who was in charge of the army, the School of America said that. And I am sure that the people who tortured me, I never saw them because I was blind. I am sure that they came to the School of the America. So, you know, in a given moment, uh, the brother of Ita Ford, one of the North American nuns killed in 1980, he found the general in Florida. To uh, enjoying retirement in Florida, very rich guys, you know, millionaires, with their boats, their cars, their business, their money. And he decided to make a lawsuit against them. And he asked me to participate. So I did. I did come to Florida in 2002. And we accused the general, General Luis Casanova and General Garcia, both, both are Minister of Defense and the other Minister of Defense. We accused them of being responsible for what, for, for what happened. Three Salvadores, Eddie Gonzalez, Juan Romagosa, and myself. Um, 
you know, the general denied. They say, oh, I didn't know. 100,000 Salvadorians were killed. And one of the generals say, I never saw a body on the street. Wow, he was black dog. He was asking, General, did you know about the, the massacre in a little village named El Mosote? 900 villagers were killed there. 900, children, women, everybody, 900. And he said, I didn't know. But General, you read the newspaper. I said, no, I do not read the newspaper. But you watch TV, no, I don't watch TV. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, you listen to the radio. I said, no, I do not listen to the radio. So a person who was there said, General, I am a woman. I am a woman. I was able to come to El Mosote by myself and look <coughs> all the people killed there. And he said, OK, I am going to tell you why I didn't come to investigate. Because he, as a minister of defense, was supposed to investigate any violation, any human rights violation, any abuse carried out by the army. But he said, I'm going to tell you why I didn't come. I didn't come because I have no means of transportation. And you know why we never investigate human rights abuses? Because soldiers have no pen or paper to write. Right. Yeah. The jurors found them liable. The jurors say, no, you are, you are liars. You know? How come a Minister of Defense didn't know about what happened? Also, so it was the very first time that the, the Salvadorian generals were found liable in the United States, or any court. Because in El Salvador, they enjoy impunity. They are free. You know, There is an amnesty law given to them that uh, exempt them from their crimes. They are free to come to El Salvador Never ever, nobody has been ever accused of human rights violations in El Salvador. So after the trial, you know, after the trial, I was a landmark case in, in, in our case. I came back to San Francisco to teach. Because I was a teacher. I was a full-time teacher. I came back to teach. But it was impossible because everybody wanted to talk to me. The, the, the newspaper, the, the TV, you know. And also people asking me to come and tell about what happened in Florida. So, because also Roy Bourgeois came and said, Carlos, I want you to come in November to Fort Benning. Every year in November, we have a, a, a vigil in front of the gates, the main, main base in Fort Benning. In the base is a School of the Americans. But I couldn't. Then I realized that it was impossible for me trying to uh, tell what happened to me and being a, a permanent or full-time teacher. So I gave up my teaching position and I became a, a human rights advocate. I am a person who travels around and come places like this to denounce torture. To denounce and to tell people that torture is not the past. It's not the past, it's real. It's real, you know, it's real. Now, right now, uh, from Amnesty International, 126 countries, governments, are uh, engaged in torture. 126 government engaged in torture. So I gave up my teaching position. I began to, to work with uh, Roy Bourgeois in the School of American Watch. But also I decided to found, and I found with other torture survivors, Stop Impunity Project. That's it made of Salvadorian torture survivors. Uh, we are trying to find some help, uh, basically therapy, because they the trauma that we have is so, so, so terrible. You know, we are wounded forever. We, 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 there is no way that we can heal completely. Because as I said before, any time that I have seen a person being blindfolded, it brings memory of what happened to me. Any time that I have seen uh, a, a piece of uh, war, for example, or on TV or a movie, it brings memory of what happened to me. Or any kind of violence is affecting me. So, when I came to the School of America Watch, I, I told Roy that one of the ways to close the School of the America should be uh, asking government in South America or Central America not to send soldiers to the School of the America. See? And uh, we were very, very fortunate that when we came to Venezuela, 
President Hugo Chavez, and we came to talk to him and tell him about the, the story, the horrible story of the School of America. President Hugo Chavez immediately, immediately said, no more Venezuelan soldiers to the School of America. Finished. Then we move and we visit the, uh, President Evo Morales, a very humble guy. <laughs> you cannot believe how humble he is. No, he's, a, he's a peasant, he's a, a farm, farm leader, you know. And we came to see him, 5 a.m. He worked from 5 in the morning to 11 p.m. So we came to see him, and we tried to explain him and say, that's all right, you know. Right now there are several, a couple of Bolivian soldiers in the School of America, but uh, those, after they finish, se acabó. So we got the support of President Evo Morales, and then we moved to another country, we moved to, to Uruguay. In Uruguay, we found a beautiful, a wonderful, an incredible human being, Azucena Berruti is her name. She's the Minister of Defense, the Secretary of Defense. She's a woman who, who was the defense lawyer of political prisoner in Uruguay. And uh, during the dictatorship, military dictatorship in Uruguay, one third of the, the Uruguayan population was in prison. One third. <laughs> or Uruguayan population. They were tortured and then placed on, 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 on prison. And she was the defense lawyer, the, made the defense for them. She now is the Minister of Defense, right? We came to talk to her. And she said, do not explain me about the school of the America. We know them. We know who they are. We know that they are a bunch of people. We know that they are young people. She keeps in her desk a, a boat made <coughs> from uh, good chips by a prisoner that gave it to her a long time ago. So in order to remind her who she is, she kept the boat in her desk. Now she is the boat of the military. All of the colonels and the generals have to obey her orders. You see how different. And then she said, yes, you know, indeed, Uruguay is no longer sending soldiers to the America. Then we moved to Argentina. In Argentina, we met another wonderful, beautiful minister of defense, a woman, Nina Garrido. The same thing. Her husband, was, he was disappeared and tortured by the military. He was killed by the, the Argentinian military in the, 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 the dictatorship. And she said, I agree with you guys. We do not need the school of the America. They are a bunch of killers and abusers. No more soldiers. No more Argentinian soldiers to the school of the America. So we moved also to Chile, and then we went to Ecuador, and then we went to Peru, and we went to Colombia, and uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, the president of Costa Rica agreed with that. So, so far we have basically seven counties no longer sending soldiers to the School of the Americas. And this is what happened. Right now, as I am talking with you, the worst record in human rights abuses is, is uh, by the Colombian government. You know, Colombia is terrible. A lot of human rights advocates have been killed. A lot of union leaders have been killed. A lot of students have been killed by the, the, by the paramilitary, by the military themselves. However, right now, the biggest client of the School of the Americas, the Colombians, mm -hmm. they are sending a lot of Colombian soldiers to the School of the Americas. The other countries are sending a very few. The remaining countries, Republic of Dominican, El Salvador, Guatemala. But the Colombians are sending by thousands. However, the second county sending soldiers is Mexico. Mexico is sending around 100 a year, but the Colombians, thousands of them. So, we believe that keeping the grassroots movement here, you know, keeping the beaches there in Corbeni, and also asking the Congress of the United States to cut the money for the School of America, we are going to close it. Uh, we have been very close to get enough votes to close the School of America. So far, we were short. This year, we were short of six votes. Only six. That's okay. Next, next time. But uh, as we have been working, you know, uh, we believe that if, if it is not this coming year, maybe the next year we are going to close. 
to America. And uh, in November, we are going to the beach there. So I'm coming here to invite you, if you want, want to travel with us in November, the 16th of November, the 16th and 17th of November, to have a beach there. Uh, we are a big, big grassroots organization. Uh, Robert is part of the, the, the School of American Watch. He, any one of you need information, he can, he can provide information about the trip. We rent buses from here to New York and go there. It's a short trip. A short trip because what I do is I do travel from San Francisco all the way to Fort Benning. So we ride two weeks. You know, we stop in several cities in the mountains of North America. So we cross the United States back and forth. So we ride 6,000 6, miles in three weeks to denounce the School of the Americas. So I gave up my teaching position. I became a human rights advocate. You know, I've been working on that. I believe that the reason why I'm alive is because I've been asking many times, how come you escape? Well, I'm a very lucky person. Um, you know, it's because I need to tell this story. I need to tell people what happened. I was there. I was in the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people do not believe, you know. Well, maybe it's not true. When I began to tell my story, probably I said it by the first time, probably five or six years ago, I was able to come out with the story. Like I couldn't before, it was too painful for me. But then I realized that after telling my story, I realized that everything that happened to me, every single step that happened to me in the Chamber of Torture, it was made also in Iraq. It was made also in Abu Ghraib. All of the prisoners in Abu Ghraib were deprived of liberty. They were badly, badly tortured. And in a given moment, when the Red Cross International came looking for the prisoner, they were taken away. That happened to me. So it is clear that the Salvadorian army came to the United States get trained here to torture in you know, so the same thing, the same method, the same step, the same position. So, um, now, what I'm doing is because I travel many, several countries, and I do also travel other Asia, I just came from Burma. By chance, I was in Burma now. Right now, there is an uprising against the government in Burma, and I was there when it began. But, uh, I went also to Cambodia. You know, Cambodia suffered a lot. Cambodia suffered with the, the regime of the Khmer Rouge by Pol Pot during the, the end of the 70s. Um, I came to a place in which it's horrible. I, I was, I was for, me, for me, as a torture survivor, coming to a place in which people have been tortured or suffered is really difficult. I cannot make it, you know. I need support. But uh, because of, uh, I am trying to help other torture survivors, and I am trying also to, to, to uh, stop torture, I have to get into those places. In Paraguay, they have the main center of torture was La Técnica. A lot of Paraguayans were tortured there. And I came the day that the torture survivor took over La Técnica. Now it's a museum. They have a lot of museum to educate people. And then when I came to Buenos Aires, uh, La Escuela de la Mecánica la Armada was a big center, one of the big centers of torture in Argentina. So, you know, I came and I got in to see the place. Difficult for me, very difficult. And when I went to Chile also, I, I, I came to Villa Grimaldi, also a place in which a lot of Chileans were tortured and killed. But I came, you know, I, I have to come there. Although I have my friends to support me, otherwise I cannot enter that place. And I went to Cambodia to uh, the main center of torture in Phnom Penh. You know, 22,000 people were tortured there. 22,000 people. It was a high school building. And the, then the, the regime uh, made the high school building, because they have already classroom. It was easy for them to bring the prisoners, put bars on the, on, the, on, the, on the windows, and make small cells or bring the, the instruments or the tools of torture there. It was horrible. But I had to come there, and I came with friends. You know, I came to look at the place. 22,000 people were tortured there. And after being tortured, they were killed. You know, the killing fields. I went to the killing fields in, in Cambodia. That's a week ago. Because uh, it is my, 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 my feeling. It is 
I believe that it is important for the Salvadorians to have a place like that, to have a place to remember. You see, because, because otherwise, the, the government, very happy with the policy of forget and forgive, you know, in the past. No, don't talk about it. No, it's good. No, forget it. No, there is no way they can forget. They ask me something impossible. How can I forget? How can a mother forget that today someone killed or disappeared? They should say, well, let's talk about it. Let's sit and talk about it. But they cannot ask me, just forget it. I cannot forget that. So I believe that um, the next project that I do have in San Salvador is um, making a place to remember in San Salvador. Uh, the clandestine cell in which I was kept and tortured is still there. It's a big building. It's still there. So I want that place for a, mem for a, for a museum. I want that place to have pictures and to educate people. Because the government again say, no, nothing happened, forget it. No, 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 the liars, the communists, and the guerrillas, and the terrorists are lying. No, they did it. And I was there. I was there. I was in the chamber of torture. So my information, information given to me that the place is still there, the government sealed it, it's sealed. But the underground cell is still there. So I, I hope I can get enough support to make that place a, a, a museum or a place to remember. That's very important. And I believe that now, after so many years of leaving the, the prison, after I'm becoming a, a kind of telling my story in a way that is more, not only for my own healing, because indeed, when I am talking about it, kill me, but also, you know, not to repeat that, that horror. Because if we do not have a place like that in El Salvador, the Salvadorian government or whoever will repeat it. But they, uh, they are happy, you know, capturing people again and torturing. Let me finish, let me finish with uh, one of my experiences uh, after I left the prison. Uh, I was badly, badly tortured, and, and uh, I went to Mexico. I left the country because when I, I came out of the building, uh, one of the guys in the main gate of the building, I thought I was going to kill her. When I was there, uh, the guy told me, you are a lucky man. Indeed, he said, better you leave the country. Otherwise, next time, you will be I went to Hillen, and then I got some money. Then I went to Mexico to heal and to wait for my paper because I was going to Europe for my PhD. My sister called me from San Francisco and said, before you go to Europe, come to visit us. And I did. I took a plane, made it in Yucatan, Mexico, and uh, still suffering, still suffering from the wounds that I was. I was still uh, broken bones and suffering. You know, as I was from Yucatan to Miami, 20 minutes after the plane was in the air, you know, the captain said, those passengers in the right side, look down, that island is Cuba. You, <laughs> you. <laughs> well, maybe one day I'm coming to Cuba because I pay my dues already. <laughs> so I, yeah, I'm coming to Cuba fine. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and, uh, I know that you have questions, and we have also some some time. So I, I would love if you have some questions. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, my family was looking for me. But what happened is that when they came to the place in which I was kept, I was prisoner, the colonel said, Give me here. My family was looking for me in many, many places. 
My family began to, to look in some places, but also my family was looking in the, in the when they heard that this a, a body, doctor, they came to yeah, to look if uh, I was the, the, the doctor body. Also, they came to the um, mortuary place. Many corpses were around there, and then people came to identify. So my family, they were looking for me, and I was told after that indeed they came to the National Police headquarters, and the guy said, he's not here. Yeah, the problem is that it's, the, it's, it's uh, the Pentagon. The Pentagon is the ruling the that school. It belongs to the Pentagon. So the army is ruling it. Yeah, uh, and also it's, a, it's a basically the uh, flagship, the big, because there are several, several schools to train foreigners in the United States. Uh, African soldiers that come to the United States and get trained, they come to a, a school. Uh, Middle Eastern soldiers that come to get trained here, they go to another school. But the School of the Americas is exclusive for Latin American soldiers. It's a huge, huge school. 20 million a year. 20 million a year. It costs 20 million a year to run it. And it's the biggest. It's the biggest. It's the, the model for them, you know. Any time, any time that you you can see that the the United States Army needs somebody to carry out some plans like a coup or killing, those guys are in charge. So they are they are basically the muscle, the muscle for USA corporations in Latin America. You see, they are they are the guys who kill the labor union leader. They are the guys who kill Bishop Romero. You see, those guys who openly oppose the policies of the government or the policies of the United States, they are in charge of killing. What is your girlfriend? my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I couldn't. She was here. She was a guerrilla member and she was a, a guerrilla commander. Very brave, very smart woman. She was killed in combat. She was killed in combat. She was fighting against the army. She was killed in, in, in combat in the mountains. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, when in a given moment in the prison, I, I thought if they asked me about her, I don't know. I, I mean, I thought that I was going to say nothing. But uh, I don't know because they never asked me about her. So. When I came out of prison, I got a letter from her asking me about it. And she wanted me to, to go to see her in Mexico when I came here. But I couldn't leave the country. She was in Cuernavaca, in Mexico, and they said, come on, come on. I can take her for a while, but I couldn't. So, yeah, she was killed in 1985, two years after I left the country. You see, the, the Salvadorian army has a special unit, you see, and this is the situation. The Salvadorian name those groups, uh, they, those groups are death squad, the death squad. The death squad. The people who came to looking for me in the prison, the Red Cross International. And you know what happened? This is what happened to me. Look how, 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 how lucky I am. I'm lucky, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. I'm very lucky. Look at what happened. What happened is that the, the day that they came looking for me, I was taken away. Right? Okay. But the group that came looking for me asked permission come to look for me. So the military, they knew that they were coming looking for me, so they took me away. Now, now. But 
se llama Lucky Guy. The next day, they came and announced. Uh, they didn't say that they were coming. And then the colonel in charge said, you cannot come in because you came yesterday. So we comply already. You came yesterday, so forget it. And then one of the guys says, yeah, but you know what? Yesterday, our boss didn't come. So now she is here. And yesterday, it doesn't count because she was not here. So now she's here and she was here. That's what I'm like. And then the guy, the guy against, you know, he said, no, you know, but finally, he has to, he has to accept. And they enter. And they come. Wow. <laughs> That's what happened. Are you the only survivor of the church? No, from El Salvador, no, no, to tell you the truth, no. There are several, there are, there are, I, I cannot say the number because... Well, I didn't know what you are doing. Yeah, no, 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 this is the situation, this is the situation. For a torture survivor, it's so difficult to talk about such experience that most of them prefer not to talk. Now, the other group is the torture survivor that can talk after 15 or 15 years after. And the other group uh, are the, the name that we never talk about. That. Amongst the group who are able to speak and tell the, the, the story, very few of them become activists, and I'm one of them. So the other situation that is, is very important to let you know, guys, is that there are no women torture survivors. I'm a torture survivor, a male. Women torture survivor, very few. All of them, all of them are killed. Women are killed. You see, I have met, I have met, in my, my experience, I have met only, only Salvadorian torture survivor, women, only four, bro. And taken prisoner by thousands. But a women are killed, I believe, I don't know. I believe, this is my guess. I believe women are killed because uh, there is a, the army itself has a, has a feeling of uh, misogyny. You know, they do not like women, you know? And a, a woman who is a, a, a leader, a social leader, she must be very, very intelligent because she overcame a lot of obstacles. Because you know that organization or whatever it is, is Whatever organization is basically run by men, but if she, as a female, she has been able to become a leader, then she must be very, very intelligent. So that's why, besides women are a lot of vulnerable, you know, all women are raped, all women are gun raped in, in the prison. So I believe that the army also truly believe that the place of the woman is the house. So if she becomes a, a, an activist, a leader, uh, She's truly dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's why I believe women are key. Yeah, fine. Yeah. As you're talking about um, human rights violations, I um, I couldn't help but think about Iraq. And um, I'm thinking about the prisoners who were at Guantanamo Bay and things like that. Is it any way that people who probably were t tortured there and released, do you think there's any kind of way you might be able to have them connect up with you in any way? Or even I was thinking too about, uh, I think it was on the weekend, I was, I was reading or I saw the news. I'm, I'm a little emotional because of what you said. Um, I was seeing on the news where um, the army generals that are in Iraq, they have these special guards that guard them and they were accused of um, like killing civilians. And I know all that comes on the human rights violations. Is there any way that they might connect up with you or anything to, to maybe um, make your cause more, you know, public? Or we are something? connected. We are connected yeah. through an organization that is in Washington, D.C. Okay. It's a task, is the name of the organization, yeah. Torture uh, Abolition for uh, Coalition. Okay. And uh, indeed, we have people from Iraq there. Okay. Every every 26th of June, okay. we met there. But also, uh, my case in Florida against the Salvadorian general is a landmark case. The very first time, 
that two general have been found liable for human rights abuses in the United States. So that case is the basis for the cases that are, are coming. And let me tell you this. You know, in the United States, now it's legal to torture. The Bush administration made it legal to torture. It's legal to torture now. You see, they say that, yeah, it's possible to torture. And also, in last November, last November they took away the highest court which is your right to challenge your detention. Habeas corpus no longer exists in the United States. The army can take you, put in prison, no question. Nobody can ask about you. Habeas corpus, gone, you know, a, a, a right that we have enjoyed for many, many years, gone. No longer habeas corpus exists in the United States. And then you can be also tortured. You can be also tortured, it's legal. But, I'm still saying, in, you are making legal in the United States, but it's a crime. It's a crime, no matter what. It's a crime. And torture is forbidden. So no matter, no matter what reason you are telling me to torture a person, if you engage in torture, you have carried out the crime. And sooner or later, we can take you to the tribunal. Because it's very important. That's a very, very important thing. Yes. Um, two questions. You said that you were told to leave El Salvador so, you know, you might be killed. Were there other people who also left after going through what you went through? Some of you have a class that was going through the circle. Alright, just tell me the last part. You were told to leave for your safety. Were there others like you who were tortured that also did leave? And have you ever been back to El Salvador since then? I, well, several people left the country, indeed. And, uh, People affected by the violence, they left the country, indeed. And out of five million in 1980s, the Salvadorian came to the United States by a million. One fifth of the population came to the United States. There are thousands, thousands of people just living, 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 because we couldn't. And it's clear, Los Angeles, right now, right now, Los Angeles, more than, more than a million Salvadorians. And Washington, D.C., 600,000. The Bay Area, 30,000. So we are in a lot of because we left the country because of the violence. We were afraid. Uh, it was so dangerous in El Salvador that uh, young people were killed for, for having jeans, wearing jeans. Blue jeans? You had a blue jeans? We were suspect. They, they suspected you as a guerrilla. So they kill you. They kill young people because they have blue jeans. Have you ever been born? Blue jeans. They wear blue jeans. Because, because uh, the, the United States government, she asked me why they talked me about Cuba. Because the United States wanted to prove that not the Salvadorians were making the war in El Salvador, but the Cuba. That in Iraq, not the Iraqis are doing the war, but the foreigners. They did the same thing. So they wanted to show that me, I went to Cuba to get ready. That's why they kept me alive also. And did I confess? And I confess I never been to Cuba. <laughs> 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 and if it, it's your question, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was asking if you ever been back. Oh, yes, I did. I did. No. I went back to El Salvador in 19, 19, 1990, 1997. By the first time, I went back to El Salvador. 1987, yeah. 14 years after being captured and captured. And I came to, you know, in a way, to um, get some explanation of what happened to me, uh, to recon reconcile with my country, you know, that kind of thing. And I was robbed. <laughs> we were there. In, we, were there in, we were there in the restaurant. We were in the restaurant, and then we were having dinner. My brother, my sister, my kids, my wife, everybody enjoying it. And then the the waiter come and say, uh, they are robbing, they are robbing, they are uh, robbers. <laughs> and I thought he was in the street. <laughs> when the guys came with the shotgun. Oh, no. Oh, Give me your money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> my poor wife, she said in English, no, my paper, because she got the, the passport with them. No, 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 my paper. 
And then one of the guys said, oh, she has dollars. She has dollars. She she's talking to me. Show me the dollars. So yeah, I came back to San Salvador. I was very sad. You know what? I was sad because the situation in El Salvador is worse than before the war. And it's worse because despite of the peace agreement, the government and the, the ruling class in El Salvador never, never find a solution to the problems in El Salvador. Poverty, lack of education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, unemployment. They, they never look at it. And the main mistake that was made in El Salvador, the main mistake made in El Salvador is that the Salvadorian government and the USA government came with a military solution to a social problem. It's not possible. No way, no way. You cannot find a solution to a social problem through military means. Impossible. Yeah. Question. Um, were there questions you knew about like, they had this unemployment thing and they were talking Yeah, well, the, 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 the whole situation about Cuba is that the government, they, it was Reagan administration, you know, when I was captured, it was Reagan administration. They really, really wanted to show that it was the Soviet Union and Cuba was making the revolution in El Salvador. That was the whole point, that it was Cuban fighters and Soviet Union advisors in the guerrilla movement. Uh, I was in El Salvador, and I've been in El Salvador, and I never seen a Cuban, less a Soviet person, never. And that is to deny you know, the root of the problem that in El Salvador, indeed, a big injustice was carried out. You know, a big, big injustice. The Indians were deprived of the land, the communal land, in 18, 1875. Uh, they were forced to give up the land because the, the owners of the country want to plant uh, coffee. And the, the, the mountain where the Indians live, the coffee grows there. So all of the peasants, all of the Indians, uh, basically they were robbed. Their land was taken by the, by the government. And they say, if you do not plant coffee, you have to give up the land. Those guys, later make a big, big uprising in 1942. Those guys, the same guys that were landless. <coughs> and since then, in 1942, the Salvadoran government killed more than 30,000 peasants in less than a month. Wow. And then the military began to, to rule the Salvador, El Salvador since 1932. And we enjoy a dictatorship since 1932 until 1979 that the civilian came, but again after the war, the rulers of the country took over again. And right now, right now, the Arena Party is in power, has been in power for 20 years. And the guy, the founder of the Arena Party is Roberto Dawison, Mayor Roberto Dawison, and he is the guy who ordered the killing of Bishop Romero. So you see? So we are in a long struggle for justice, in a long struggle for even myself, you know, seeking justice, right? Seeking justice. The basic fulfillment of justice that I need. Because uh, I came to visit the therapist, psychologist and psychiatrist, and uh, give me treatment. And I, in a way, I improve in, in many ways after coming to therapy. And I have been in treatment for many, many years. But uh, indeed, one of the therapists came and told me, you know, Carlos, therapy is limited. You know, therapy may help you, but indeed what you need is justice. That's what you are craving for, for justice. And that probably happened to me when I came to Florida and confronted the perpetrators in Florida, two Salvadoran gentlemen. Oh, you say that you say that you confronted. 
comprender, ya, que comprende a mí me importa. Ya. Para that's uh, what I have been doing, that's a uh, part of my, my job now, you know, uh, traveling around and telling what happened. And um, what really happened is that as a survivor, as a person who was in the chamber of torture and survived, I believed my role now and tell what happened to me. Because others couldn't, others were killed. They cannot come here and tell what happened to them because they were killed. I'm a survivor. So I can come and tell the story. Okay. I'm going to ask for money right now. Thank you for money. I have forgotten. I have forgotten. I have forgotten. I have forgotten. Sometimes, sometimes. People help me. Besides, I run a very simple life. I don't have big expenses. And uh, indeed, uh, I am paying peanuts. But I don't have big expenses. And believe me, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy what I do. When I am when I am not in the classroom, but I enjoy being in the classroom also. Mm -hmm. My students love me because I do come to the classroom. Because I'm a super teacher. Mm -hmm. I do come and tell stories. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about it. <laughs> yeah. So that is the way that I do. I'm a poor person, but uh, I'm rich in other ways. Uh, what's one thing that you did not appreciate before your gruesome experience? Uh, that you treasure today other than your freedom. Tell me again if they didn't get one thing that you cannot appreciate for your gruesome experience? Um, that you treasure today okay. other than your freedom. Okay, I got it, yeah. One of the things that I must tell the people that I do, that I do love, that I love them. I must tell them every day that I do love them. When I was in prison, I would say, I have forgotten to tell the people how much I love them. That comes from prison. You know, when I was about to be killed, and I say, wow. But now, uh, people ask me, are you afraid? Are you afraid of being killed? Are you afraid of being killed in prison again? I say, yes, I am, because I am a human being. But of course, I am. But uh, I was about to be killed in 1983, and I am alive. So, whatever the Salvadoran government or other government do me, I don't care. I don't care about it. You know, I already, I already do Do you think they ever went back to look after you after The situation in El Salvador has changed. However, when I do come to San Salvador, I got by that. That's the people who protect me. And so that's the one of the That's I do come to El Salvador. However, if they want to capture me and kill me, they can do it. That's clear. Right. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. What little justice do you think you, um, you got after this whole audience? Well, you know, for me, for me, when I took the generals to a tribunal, that's very, very important for me. When I, I confronted them in a tribunal, it was very important for me, you know, telling them, General Garcia, General Diaz Casanova, you have to tell me now why you ordered my capture and my torture. That was very important for me. And you know that I didn't care about winning or losing the case. I did care about coming to a tribunal. That is the, the whole idea of getting justice. We won the icing of the cake, of course. But it was very important for me to come to the courtroom and tell them. And I felt, after I confront them, I felt better than having 100 hours of therapy. <laughs> Much better, because I, I did it. I came and I denounced them. The generals, they live in Florida. They're rich guys. They have a big houses. They have judges, you know? They have fancy cars. But also, after we denounced them as criminals, the neighbors, the neighbors of that, that wealthy and rich area, 
present. These people, souls, are present with us. So I find it a very, very moving experience of our day every year. I thought it should be every year since the year 2000. And plan our knowledge until the public spirit is still there. And for people who want to, <coughs> if there's anybody in the room that's interested in joining the New York City School of the American One delegation, you can contact me uh, now. Uh, I can write now by email. Uh, and this is also, this is also the other, you can visit this uh, website and get a lot of information there. Uh, It has uh, basically the whole information about what we are doing, the School of America work. Uh,